this hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. Let's go straight to the top story this evening. ICICI Bank has sacked its former managing director and CEO Chanda Kochar after an independent inquiry led by Justice Sri Krishna found her to be in violation of the bank's code of conduct in the Videocon loan case. The Sri Krishna committee, which probed the quid pro quo link in the over 3,200 crore rupee loan to Videocon, found Kocher's role in violation of the bank's framework for dealing with conflict of interest and fiduciary duties. After considering the report, ICICI Bank's board has decided to sack Kocher and in process also take back all bonuses paid to her from April of 2009 till March of 2018. Ritu Singh joins us now with the details on uh, those developments. Ritu, uh, so finally, Justice Sri Krishna presenting his report, ICICI Bank putting out highlights of that report, sacking Chanda Kotar, asking he her to repay bonuses from 2009 to 2018. Well, you know, the eight-month-long uh, inquiry headed by Justice Sri Krishna has found Chanda Kocher in violation of ICICI Bank's code of conduct, primarily on her on account of her ineffective dealing uh, with conflict of interest and due disclosure norms. And the bank, you know, uh, you know, uh, to make itself clear of this entire situation, has said the fact that these processes, the bank's due processes, are dependent solely on the discretion of the directors discharging their fiduciary duties. And and to recuse themselves uh, to avoid this conflict, uh, it is because of Chanda Kocha's lack of diligence uh, that the bank's processes have now been rendered, uh, were uh, rendered ineffective uh, as far as the ICICI Bank uh, and Videocon loan case was concerned. The bank, uh, and not, uh, you know, Justice Sri Krishna, this is the bank, it further notes that there are no implications of this inquiry report on the published financial statements. This is, of course, for the scope of the inquiry, which, last, uh, which was from uh, April of 2009 up until uh, March of 2018. Further, you know, on receipt or uh, by after receiving and studying this report, the bank has come to the conclusion uh, that, uh, you know, Chanda Kocha's separation from the bank will be treated as termination for cause. And therefore, uh, the penalty that has been imposed on Chanda Kocha is that all the bonuses that were given to her between, uh, you know, uh, 2009 April to now until March 2018 will have to be returned to the bank. Now, uh, you know, uh, reading all of these, uh, you know, uh, details that have been made public by ICICI Bank, there are still several questions that loom large. And first and foremost, of course, is the fact that the scope of the inquiry under Justin Sri Krishna was not supposed to be limited only, uh, you know, to the following of due processes. It was supposed to be all comprehensive. It was supposed to look into kickbacks as well, uh, you know, whether or not there was any quid pro quo. All of that has not been covered, at least in the part uh, or whatever has been made public by the bank in its statement today. Further, uh, you know, uh, what is the role of the board? Uh, you know, the, is the credit committee cleared of any charges? Is the board cleared of any charges? Because Chanda Kocher alone has been found responsible for this. So these questions uh, remain unanswered, whether there is more to this inquiry, whether uh, and also the timing of this, uh, you know, uh, report coming now after CBI has, uh, you know, uh, filed an FIR in the matter. All of that, of course, is being questioned. But yes, for now, Chanda Kocher has been found guilty. Well, that is right. She has been indicted by Justice Sri Krishna. But uh, let me go across to Lata. Lata, what's your take on the Sri Krishna Committee's findings against Chanda Kocher? Uh, the fact of the matter is, and we don't know, on the basis of what has been put out publicly by ICICI Bank, whether the issue of criminality has been addressed at all by the Sri Krishna Committee. What we know is ICICI's version of the inquiry report. We don't have the inquiry report and it's a very uh, succinct one-page uh, paraphrase of the findings of that inquiry report, which must be a lengthy document. So uh, what we know from the bank's press release is it is distancing itself from Chanda Kocher's activities. It says that the inquiry report found her only guilty of the limited problem of uh, not disclosing and not recusing herself. And they have given a fairly serious punishment of taking away 10 years of her earnings and all future earnings uh, from her position in the bank. Now, uh, you know, criminality could not anyway have been uh, established by uh, the uh, report. After all, Justice Sri Krishna could not have asked her for the bank statement of her husband. I mean, he has no authority to do that. He could have only looked at her emails and emails within the bank. He does not have search and seizure powers because he's been appointed by a private entity. So, uh, I don't, I mean, you could not even have expected him to pronounce upon criminality. 
we don't know whether he says in the report that the bank lost any money because of it, uh, of this uh, action of non-disclosure. Uh, the way the bank has interpreted is that there is no uh, uh, impact on the bank's financial statement. So from there we can deduce that probably he has said that there is no impact of uh, you know the borrower getting any unfair advantage because of the non-disclosure. That's uh, he probably has said it, and that is why uh, the bank is saying that there is no material, there is no impact of the inquiry report on the bank's financials. For, uh, uh, as for the, uh, you know, the ongoing investigation by the CBI, uh, my sense is it, it has certainly made life difficult for Chanda Kochar because this report will add to the evidence against her. Though it will be a fresh case of, you know, criminality, you will need a lot more evidence. Uh, when you are making a civil charge, then all you need to know is that, oh, you should have disclosed, you should have recused. It's easy to make that complaint against her. To prove yeah. criminality will will be very, very difficult. A final point, is the punishment excessive? Now, when I ask private sector bankers, they think it is excessive because if you have concluded that there is no loss to the bank, you have said that the financial statement is intact, uh, the borrower would anyway have got the same covenants, uh, uh, then why such an excessive punishment? But if, when, when I ask public sector bankers, they mm. point to Usha and say, she has lost all her bonuses, though she had no you know, conflict at all. It was only an act of omission. And she lost yeah. all her uh, pension. So public mm. sector bankers tell me that, well, are not public sector bankers punished? So this is fair. But, uh, uh, you know, private sector bankers have point out that if there is no loss to the bank, then why are they punishing her, taking away 10 years of her uh, salary? I think it is a massive, it is a massive blow. And, but it raises a very, very big question. The big question is, what about the board of ICICI? The reason I am saying is this, because when this thing came into light, mm. the first thing the board, without even twinkling the eyes, said that we have full faith in Chanda Kochar and we have conducted inquiry and there is nothing wrong. Now, when Justice Sri Krishna finds that Chanda Kochar failed to follow the internal code of conduct, now I am surprised if a justice is required to find mm. that there is a failure, that somebody has failed to follow the internal code of conduct, then what the board was doing? Mm. The board gave a clean kit to Kanchanda Kocha. So the question that is being okay. raised and the reputation will be raised is that those people who were sitting in the board of ICC at that particular time and who gave clean kit, whether they gave clean kit in the hurry or they were part of the whole process. No, I would uh, be, uh, be curious to know whether... Uh, uh, how the Justice Sri Krishna report would have read before the uh, CBI. Secondly, uh, definitely, uh, I mean, uh, see, again, this brings to light uh, the uh, role of or the importance that is given to star CEOs and the role of the board. Mm. So uh, the, the equation between a star CEO and the board is something, I think, that is getting slowly defined in mm. corporate India. Mm. And again, here, a star CEO to, to, to step off the line and even when there was a whistleblower report, the board just uh, went and sort of uh, said there is nothing wrong. And they didn't even conduct an inquiry. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, I think the board should have uh, said mm -hmm. our primacy is to shareholders and then conducted an inquiry. And this uh, yes, is, sir. I think, uh, more important going forward for corporate mm -hmm. India. The basis on which the report is made, of course, we don't know the facts. You know, we've known the facts through media reports over the past one one or two years. Um, but uh, given that they've looked at the facts in detail, they seem to have determined that, you know, any kind of conflict of interest has to be disclosed by a particular person. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the, a board cannot predict <coughs> what conflicts of interest exist. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, broadly, I think uh, it sounds right. Mm. And, uh, you know, essentially, unless a person discloses that, his or her uh, husband mm. or wife are kind of mm. uh, having a side deal mm. uh, with with the borrower. It's mm. impossible for, uh, uh, unless they are fortune tellers, it's impossible for the board to come to know. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, the, the role of a board is not really to be a bloodhound. Mm. Uh, they, what comes to the board, of course, they should, they mm. should and must look at it uh, with, uh, uh, with care, diligence and loyalty. Mm.
but beyond that i I, uh, i unless they had a red flag and they avoided uh, seeing the red flag uh, which mm. which of course we can get into mm. uh, and that's a separate question well reactions death to the shri krishna committee report indicting chanda kochar saying she is guilty of violating the code of conduct of icici bank but the other big story that we're tracking tonight devan housing finance is taking cobra post to court this after the investigative web portal alleged that the company's promoters siphoned off 31000 crore rupees through shell companies the stock continued to fall in today's session closing about 5% lower The housing finance company came out with what it said was a clarification through a conference call. The DHFL management said that the allegations against the company are malicious and it intends to take legal measures to examine the complaint. It's also termed the complainant's motive as a conspiracy to destabilize the company. In fact, it says it's on account of business rivals. DHFL went on to add that the company is making no contribution to any political party or subsidiaries. Let's listen into some of the key takeaways from the investor conference call. called the DHFL held this morning no respite for the stock to down 5% as a core investment company uh, which is regulated by the reserve bank of india having got its approval for overseas direct investment uh, um, you know to be made um, to be made abroad we have remitted close to uh, 100 million pounds right for making investments in financial assets which has been duly disclosed at all points in time including the balance sheet and it is not even dhfl now this was done at the wgc level but have a global capital level which is the holding company of the company so to say that there are shell companies where more than 5000 crores of money has been sent abroad um, you know is itself um, you know wrong it itself malicious and uh, and clearly has been done to malign the company's image in the in the public this is not a whistle blower this oh. is a frivolous complaint which has been filed and which has been taken note of and yes the matter stands sub judice for which the company is taking all remedial legal measures uh, to address there is no political contribution made by dhfl or any of its associates subsidiaries etc okay um uh, so so yes i would like to vehemently deny that because this is a direct allegation on the promoters of the company this is a direct allegation on dhfl right which obviously we will take it to its logical conclusion in the court of law Well, from one controversy to another, the National Statistical Commission, India's nodal body for all core statistical activities, is now effectively defunct. Two independent members of this vital organisation, who were appointed by this same government in 2017, have resigned in protest. A career statistician, P. C. Mohanan, who was acting chairperson, and J. V. Minakshi, an independent member and professor at the Delhi School of Economics, have resigned, saying that the government is not taking them seriously. With their resignation, there are no independent members left in the NSC, and only. the secretary which is the chief statistician pravin shrivastava and the ex officio member amitab kant remain in the panel so why the resignations there were two major flash points first was the fi18 employment survey by the national sample survey organization the other flash point was the recently released gdp back series data that lowered the growth rate during the upa era my colleague anshu sharma spoke with pc mohan and he said that he resigned as the statistical body was not being taken seriously the reason for our resignation is basically we thought the nsc is not able to contribute the objectives for which it was set up mm-hmm. uh, like being the apex body for all official statistics and uh, we were not being taken very seriously on right mm-hmm. what are the key issues that you think were not being taken seriously by this commission since it only comprised of four members what could go wrong Uh, see some of the key decisions are on statistical matters nothing else no mm-hmm. this is a purely professional body mm-hmm. so some of the key decisions on statistical issues were not coming to the commission or coming after it is already taken up so that is why we thought you uh, know it's not being uh, very seriously taken what about the employment survey data which mm-hmm. is approved by the commission but not mm-hmm. released yet see the normal practice for nsso report is nsso is under the oversight of the commission or all mm-hmm. technical work and all nsso reports are uh, approved by the commission for release 
Mm -hmm. Before the commission, there used to be a governing council. Mm -hmm. And uh, from 2006, the governing council's job has been given to the commission. So all NSSO reports are approved by the commission. And then it is released by the NSSO. So there is one report which we approved and that has not been released yet. Mm -hmm. So, so it's also one of the reasons. Okay. There was controversy with regards to how Niti IO came out with a backdated GDP series. Uh, so you even raised it. So what was the whole idea of raising that as an issue? Did you reach out to the government and uh, seek clarity as to how the commission will work and what are, what are the issues that is prevailing and that commission is not able to um, work on? See, commission is not part of the government. It is an independent mm -hmm. setup. So mm -hmm. it is not necessary for us that we have to uh, appraise the government. Mm -hmm. And chief statistician is secretary of the commission, is part right. of the government. Uh, so there is no issue. And uh, what we did not like is the involvement of Niti Aayog in the GDP release, and not as such the figures or methodology or anything like that. And mm -hmm. this is, uh, that is what we said. Well, that is P.C. Mohanan, uh, the acting chairman of the National Statistical Commission who has resigned in protest. Meanwhile, in its response, the government says the NSSO is still processing data. The Indian Express, citing a source at the NSSO, reports that the government is most likely holding back the jobs data because it's not presenting a good picture. The government also hit back at Mohanan's charge that the NSC did not like the involvement of the Niti Aayog when it came to the recently released GDP back series data. The government said the NSC itself had urged the ministry to find finalize and release the report. Well, we spoke with Pranab Sen, the former chief statistician, and Sudip Tomandle, who was a member of the Statistics Commission. Here's what they had to say. First of all, I'm very disappointed that uh, a body like the National Statistical Commission, which was established on the recommendations of uh, Dr. Rangarajan, who was the, he was the original uh, chair of the first National Statistical Commission then said that there should be a continuing body uh, that uh, and this is a fairly high level body and that the members of that commission have had to resign because they said they were being ignored is very very disappointing but having said that I must say I am also not at all surprised because uh, you know if a commission which is supposed to oversee the entire statistical system of this country including uh, the work being done by NSSO and the CSO side of MOSPI uh, can be ignored. What's the point of having such a commission? They, they might as well go, which is what they've done. They've done exactly the respectable thing that any self-respecting professional would do if indeed they were being ignored. And the fact that some things are being hidden, we've all been waiting desperately for this employment data because we haven't had any data since 2011-12. And that's being kept from the country and the public is, uh, is shameful, I think. If the government needs to be shaken up to take uh, the credibility and integrity of the statistical system seriously, then we're already in trouble. Mm. So uh, the fact of the matter is that having been the chief statistician and then having been the chairman of the NSC, at no time mm. did I have to contend with uh, political pressure mm. being brought. So the mm. governments and series of governments, including the current one, because mm. I was there as the chairman of NSC for two years of the current government, mm. um, never put uh, the kind of uh, the pressures that uh, apparently the NSC is saying that it's now being felt. Mm. Uh, so this is the aberration. And I think what the resignations have done is to really bring the aberration out into mm. the limelight. Mm. And that's an important step, not just for this government, but for all governments of the future. Well, reaction still coming in to that controversy. Meanwhile, Congress leader Milind Deora has slammed the government over the resignations by the members of the NSC. We bring you that exclusive interaction up ahead on India Business Hour.
Just three months to go for the Lok Sabha elections and politicians are going all out to attract rural voters. Rahul Gandhi has promised a minimum income guarantee for the poor if voted to power. Many believe this is a preemptive strike as the government is also working on an income scheme of its own. Meanwhile, the former chief economic advisor Arvind Subramaniam has proposed an income support scheme called the Quasi-Universal Basic Rural Income. The scheme proposes to transfer 18,000 rupees per year to each rural household. Arvind Subramaniam has pegged the cost of this scheme at 1.3% of GDP with a total outlay of 2.64 lakh crore rupees. Now, according to his proposal, the centre and states will jointly finance the scheme in a 50-50 model. He also proposes scrapping of other farm subsidies to save money for the income scheme. The big questions, will this scheme be fiscally prudent? Will all states come on board? And will it be correct to eliminate existing farm subsidies or will there be political will, in fact, to do so? Joining us now is the man himself, Arvind Subramaniam. Mr. Subramaniam, thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. This was an idea that you first proposed in the economic survey in 2016-17. It didn't find much traction then, but it certainly seems to have found traction now. The Congress party has adapted your idea of a universal basic income and has suggested a minimum income guarantee for the poorest of poor households. You are now suggesting a quasi-universal basic rural income uh, to address 75% of the rural population. So you do agree that the earlier idea of a universal basic income, which was universal and unconditional in your own words, cannot work in India? Well, uh, f- first of all, uh, I think that, um, you know, while we first proposed the idea in, you know, February uh, uh, 2017, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that it's kind of been very much part of the policy discussions. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's been discussed uh, by Jammu and Kashmir first. But also, I think uh, schemes like Right to Bandhu and Kalia are in the spirit of a universal basic income. All right. Now, um, what uh, we have proposed, uh, uh, you know, most recently, this uh, quasi universal basic rural income is just a, a, a kind of acknowledgement that uh, the political opportunity for this has been created by the agrarian distress. So, you know, uh, you know, policies don't just get made in a vacuum. You know, you need some kind of conditions for it to come about. And, you know, agricultural distress seems to have provided the political opportunity. And that's why we saw right to Bandhu and then Kalia being enacted. So, so what, and of course, loan waivers, of course, loan waivers as well. So what we're saying now is that let's begin with a version of universal basic income. Let's apply it to rural India because that's where the distress is most acute. And let's try and do better than existing schemes that are trying to address a similar problem. So as we said, uh, you know, um, loan waivers, right to Bandhu, Kalia, uh, not Kalia, uh, loan waivers and right to Bandhu especially are highly regressive. They only benefit the very rich farmers because only the very rich can borrow from official sources or only the very rich have land. Uh, so uh, let's uh, kind of uh, do this in rural India, but do it in a way where implementation would be much simpler. Kalia, for example, also, I think, uh, is administratively very difficult to implement because you have to identify landed farmers, tenants, laborers. You know, it's kind of almost like an administrative yeah. night. So what we're saying is that take mm-hmm. that principle, extend it to almost all rural households and do it based not on mm. targeting in beneficiaries, which has been, you know, the bane of anti-poverty programs in India. It's so difficult to target. Instead, exclude out, you know, at some cutoff, who you think may not deserve this as much. And that's how you get a quasi-universal basic rural income. You believe that it should be uh, 50-50 almost between the centre and the states and that the states should have skin in the game, which is something that I discussed with Mr. Chidamram as well. But he did say that initially they envisaged this as largely a centrally sponsored scheme. 84,000 crores to start with, that is your estimation. But, you know, you talked about the fact that the government should not dip into the Reserve Bank's reserves to be able to fund this. But in an election year, if this were to be an announcement that the government makes in the budget, I mean, it will have to be an add-on. Uh, there 
there, there can be no political case at this point in time to do away with the current subsidies, whether it's fertilizer or any others that you've already articulated. So is that a concern that we might see this being an add-on, not just now, but even in the future? And then what does it do to the FISC? Yeah, I think you make a, I think an important distinction between whatever is going to be announced. You know, announcements are related, obviously, to politics. And, you know, uh, these announcements might happen however they happen. But the point is they will be implemented, you know, after the next election. And regardless of which government is in power at that stage, you know, you have to uh, go back to uh, the, the fiscal drawing board and, and uh, you know, have a hard look at, at the resources. So at the time of implementation, you know, after the elections, I think uh, uh, governments will have to face up to uh, having to finance this largely through existing resources. I mean, otherwise, the fiscal arithmetic can get uh, difficult, both for the centre and the state governments. I, I don't think we have a whole a lot of extra fiscal space, uh, you know, at either levels. Where could the government look uh, to raise the additional revenues to finance a scheme like this? No, what would said, the ideas be there? No, I, I think that it, it will have to come from existing resources. I mean, I mean uh, uh, you know, the whole agricultural budget will have to be looked at. The fertilizer subsidy will have to be looked at. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, and, and then going forward when the serious arithmetic is done, you know, whenever implementation time comes, uh, we may have to see if existing hmm. expenditures uh, hopefully will be enough uh, to be pruned. Uh, if not, you know, we may have to think of uh, whatever additional taxes. But but that's something that, uh, you know, uh, whatever next government comes into power will have to look at that very carefully. But let me talk to you about the risks. And that's the question that I asked that do the risks outweigh the rewards, though you certainly believe that the, that the rewards outweigh the risks. But, you know, you had uh, articulated several risks in the economic survey uh, as the arguments against a universal basic income. And largely, and that's the sort of feedback that you, you get on social media, that, you know, this is going to be a disincentive to work, that this is going to make people lazy. Uh, and what does it do to the honest taxpayer? Why should the honest taxpayer be paying for this? Uh, what is what is the how do you respond to that criticism and that argument? Yeah, so I think there are a, a, a whole series of arguments. One, of course, is you know the work thing. There, I think a lot of the evidence shows that at those levels of basic income, you know, it's not at all likely that people will stop working. Uh, I, I think that's not a very serious thing. I, I think the, the the whole thing about you know should the taxpayer pay, etc. Remember that uh, the the taxpayer is already having to pay by way of other measures that are being taken. Loan waivers, right to bandhu, kalya. I mean, if uh, always saying at this stage is there are better ways of achieving that than what. So it's not as if the political process is not, uh, you know, doing this. So the taxpayer in some ways is on the hook. Uh, the question is, what is the best way of doing it at, at this stage with all its, you know, kind of enormous benefits? Remember, you know, uh, the rural economy, uh, you know, has suffered quite a bit. And therefore, this would actually, uh, you know, mm. perk up the rural economy. And, and, and you know, uh, Harish Damodaran mm. uh, has been saying that, you know, the, uh, the rural economy is depressed. And he thinks that this kind of thing could really serve to prop up prices, raise farmer incomes, you know, just improve the rural economy more broadly. Well, uh, Mr. Subramanu, always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Well, it's a feather in the cap for Interim Finance Minister Piyush Goel. He has received the Carnot Prize by the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy for his contribution towards sustainable energy solutions. The prize recognizes his work towards power reforms and rural electrification when he was the power minister. The minister has donated the prize money to the International Solar Alliance and has credited Prime Minister Modi for making the push towards clean energy. But for this collective efforts of all of my team and the leadership that Prime Minister Modi gave, I suspect this would not have been possible. And I truly dedicate this award to all of you in this journey, which has taken us from an energy shortage to a power surplus country. This journey where we have led the world in its effort to introduce energy efficiency, particularly through the LED program, in this journey to provide energy access to every single household in this country, 
in a short span of time. Now, with around three months to go for the Lok Sabha elections, the Congress has upped the ante. The party president, Rahul Gandhi, has promised a minimum income guarantee scheme if the Congress is voted to power. He has also inducted his sister Priyanka Gandhi as the general secretary of the party for eastern Uttar Pradesh. Parikshit Lutra caught up with Congress leader Milan Deora to talk about these developments and other key economic issues. Here's an excerpt of that interaction. The Congress party over the last several months has been attacking the government over jobs data. And now there has been a big development, a controversial development. Two independent members of the National Statistical Commission have resigned because of a disagreement with the government over its failure to publish a report on jobs and also a disagreement on the GDP back data series which showed that the UPA growth was lower than the NDA growth. How do you see this development? Uh, well, I think it's a it's it's a historic move in this country. It's never happened before that. Um, I've never heard that the chairperson, no one less than the chairperson of the NSC, has quit because of pressure from the government not to release post demonetization data on unemployment. And what that really signifies is that there is a severe, serious employment and unemployment crisis in the country. Um, it also makes it abundantly clear that a policy like demonetization, um, though it may have had some wins and some gains for the economy, its losses and its um, problems far outweigh the gains. Yeah, Mr. Deoda, what we're trying to ask you is that would you agree that the government is not serious about bringing out job data in public? Absolutely. I think the government is, is fully aware that uh, their policies and demonetization being one of those policies have created a massive unemployment problem in our country. And um, look, I'm also a politician. So for, from a political perspective, when I see the kind of spin that the government is uh, presenting before the people of India in the run-up to the elections, uh, at one level you're talking about the Ram Temple. Uh, at another level you're talking about why it's important to re-elect Prime Minister Modi and bring about economic stability again. Uh, you know that these are two distractions uh, to distract people away from the failures of the last five years, mm -hmm. specifically with regards to the economy. Mm -hmm. We do boast and talk about the fact that the country is growing fast, mm -hmm. but the fact is that there's jobless growth. Mm -hmm. The fact is that demonetization has caused massive havoc mm -hmm. um, in the economy. Uh, talking about the minimum income guarantee announcement that Rahul Gandhi made uh, a few days back. Has the Congress really thought this through, how this would be implemented? Is this fiscally possible? Because uh, it seems that this was a preemptive uh, announcement. Uh, the, co the government, the NDA government, the Narendra Modi government has been talking about an income support scheme and it could be announced uh, with this vote on account or sometime after that. It seems that uh, the Congress just wanted to preempt that uh, announcement. Look, we are around, we're less than 90 days away from the general election in the country. Anything we say in our manifesto or a promise that we make as to what we'll do if we come to power in the ensuing elections can be treated as preempting, preempting what the BJP government is planning to do. The, the, the question you should be asking is not, are we being preemptive? The question you should be really asking is, um, why did the BJP government not do it in the last five years? Uh, so if it's, it, it is certainly an issue which has been talked about for the last f two or three years. It's been in the public domain. It's been something that everyone's been talking about. There's mm. been a lot of uh, charcha around it as to whether it will happen, won't mm. happen, how can it happen. Now, it's a promise we've made. Talking about Priyanka Gandhi, she's now been uh, fielded formally. She has a formal role in the Congress party. But what exactly will be that role? Will it be limited to Uttar Pradesh East or will she have a pan-India role? Will she be campaigning across the country, Mr. Deora? As far as I know, her role and her designation is very clear that she's a general secretary in the All India Congress Committee in charge of Eastern Uttar Pradesh. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's what her role will be. I think she'll be, if I were to read her role literally, I think it should mean that she will limit her um, interactions, her movement, her campaigning to Eastern UP, perhaps even to other parts of Uttar Pradesh. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but if if it if it means that you know the party and the cadre feel that she can 
her campaigning in other states in Maharashtra and other parts of the country can have a huge impact, then I don't see why she will not do that and why she will not campaign to other parts of the country. Well, here's a big development in the Rafal saga. Then we learned that the Comptroller and Auditor General's report on the Rafal aircraft deal could be submitted in the Parliament in the upcoming budget session. Top officials have confirmed to Network 18 that the CAG is now in possession of the final draft of that report. Arunima, who broke that story, filed this report. Well, two, three things. Uh, number one, uh, there will be two versions of that report. One which will be given to the parliament, which will be the public version. This version may not have the price of those 36 jets mentioned. There will be a separate version, three copies of which will be given to the Ministry of Defence. This will perhaps uh, have the price of uh, those jets. The reason being given is that uh, the MOD in its response uh, to the CAG has said that uh, in the interest of national security, the price of the jets should be kept uh, away from the public because if the price is made public, then enemy nations will get to know the kind of weaponry uh, etc that uh, the aircraft is coming loaded with number two what we are told uh, is that in this session itself the CAG is aiming to submit to the report it is saying if the public accounts committee wants to know the exact price it can get the original copy from the MOD even otherwise as per CAG officials the report that will be in the public domain will have the CAG's opinion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the deals uh, you know overall cost what essentially the CAG officials are saying is that even without mentioning the exact price the opinion will be given if the deal cracked by NDA was better or worse in terms of cost uh, and that should be sufficient for the PAC to make up its mind so those are two important points coming out Congress um, you know leaders we have been speaking to have made it clear that this this kind of arrangement is not acceptable to them uh, if indeed the CAG puts an edited version out in the public domain Congress will ensure that they raise the matter and target the government on this all right, that was Arunima reporting on the very latest in the Rafale deal case. But major indices have ended on a mixed note. With two days to go for the interim budget, it looks like there are quite a few push and pull factors that have been in play. The Sensex and the Nifty closed in the red, but with some minor losses, the Bank Nifty was the top gainer. That index led today by ICICI Bank, and that index closed with gains of nearly 1%. Midcaps continued to see buying today as well, and the index ended with gains of a little over 50 basis points. Let's shift our focus then to the big earnings of the day that from ICICI Bank, which reported a strong set of numbers for the th third quarter. Even the profits were down. The core profit or the operating profit was strong. The asset quality improved, with gross NPS falling to 7.75%. Slippages or the fresh addition to bad loans also saw a, sh a sharp fall, coming at at above 2,000 crore rupees as compared to over 3,000 crore rupees in the same uh, in the previous quarter. Meanwhile, the net interest income or NII growth hit a 15-quarter high. Now, in more earnings, Bajaj Auto also came out with its third quarter numbers and it was a disappointing performance from the two-wheeler giant with margins falling around 15 to around 15%, which is well below what the street was expecting. Its revenues, meanwhile, came in line with estimates and the profit was a beat. Now, TRAI or TRI Chairman R. Sharma says the new tariff regime for television channels empowers the consumers as it gives them a choice to pay for what they watch. In a conversation with Ashmit Kumar ahead of the February 1st deadline, that's when the a la carte regime sets in, Sharma said that the migration rate in the DTH segment remains slow, but he added that the regulator was not worried about it. Let's call it an era of consumer empowerment. Because this is an era where we are embarking, mm -hmm. where we are giving complete choice mm -hmm. to the consumers mm -hmm. to choose what they watch mm -hmm. and to pay for whatever they watch, nothing more, nothing less. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one which I just thought, thought I'll, I'll share with you. <laughs> right. Because you said it's a la carte. Of course, a la carte. The consumer has a choice to select a la carte or, or bouquet or whatever. So, right. so that's their choice. Uh, second is that, yes, we have been tracking very closely the progress of mm -hmm. consumer choice collections mm -hmm. and uh, uh, happy to inform you that, you know, yesterday we reviewed and uh, in, in the cable segment, mm -hmm. uh, the choice uh, is percent is about 65, 67, 70, around 70. Mm -hmm. However, the progress in the DTH segment is not very good. Mm -hmm. uh, let's admit that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, the good news is that in DTH we are not so much bothered mm -hmm. or so much concerned and, and let me explain why. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one is that DTH is entirely a prepaid system, mm -hmm. which means you have already paid for something which you are going to watch tomorrow. Right. So there are two kinds of you know arrangements which mm -hmm. we see in the DTH segment. Mm -hmm. One is an arrangement, a long term, slightly long term arrangement where mm -hmm. people have paid for let's say six months or eight months and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now those customers have a choice mm -hmm. either to come to the new framework mm -hmm. and then if there is any balance which they will have mm -hmm. because of the reduction in prices or change in prices, that balance will be given back to them mm -hmm. in their wallet. Right. Or they have a choice even to en enforce the contract which they have entered into with the service provider. Mm -hmm. Which means they can say, oh my pack is going to end till 31st of May, mm -hmm. I will exercise that right to continue with the pack. Mm -hmm. So they have that freedom. Mm -hmm. The second kind of, uh, you know, uh, second category of people is that they don't have a long term contract, but they have a monthly mm -hmm. contract. And the monthly recharge system is, mm -hmm. they, they opt for that. So as and when their contract, their, you know, current recharge period is going to come to an mm -hmm. end, they are going to recharge. Mm -hmm. And at the time of recharge, mm -hmm. they will have to necessarily give their mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. So that's the way. The whole thing is distributed in some sense. Mm -hmm. And it is in the interest of the service providers, as always, to actually get the customer's choice, mm -hmm. help them in, in getting their choice. Mm -hmm. so, so, so essentially, we are on track mm -hmm. and, and there is no reason for any concern. And we have ensured that there is no customer inconvenience. The Global Cab Hailing app has upgraded its community guidelines according to which riders who have been reported for bad behavior persistently may stand to lose access to the Uber app. Anu Sharma caught up with Prabhjit Singh, the head of cities for Uber India and South Asia, and he told her that respect is a two-way street and added that riders who behave poorly with the drivers persistently may also be blocked from this app. Somebody who has a consistently poor rider rating which is a rating which the riders get after the trip. So when you close a trip on the Uber platform, the same way riders give a feedback to the drivers, the drivers also on a scale of five give a feedback to the rider. If consistently over a period of time somebody gets a poor rating, they will get a couple of warnings and would be encouraged to improve their behavior and their rating. And if that doesn't happen, they will lose access. We do want to signal through this effort that respect is a two-way street and riders will need to continue offering the same level of respect which the riders expect from the drivers. In terms of the uh, uh, the measures that you've introduced today, how will you verify the genuineness of the complaint uh, put up by the driver with regard to the passenger? Because there are, uh, uh, you know, you uh, what will be the method that will go into verifying those complaints? I think the way we look at this is, as I said, the core principle of us using rating as a proxy for understanding rider or driver behavior is that we believe respect is a two-way street and every single trip becomes a data point for us to understand how that experience was. Typically, we will look at multiple factors. Rating is one of them. We will also look at other factors, for example, qualitative feedback. We will look at past history of riders and drivers involved to be able to arrive at the right conclusion. Okay. Over a period of time, using technology and algorithms, we have a rich body of patterns which we understand, mm -hmm. which then inform the actions which we take. That's the Uber spokesperson on that new, uh, you know, sort of norm that they're working on. Now, as we count down to the interim budget, FMCG and retail sectors expect reforms to give more money in the hands of customers. They expect a reduction in the corporate tax to boost expansion plans. Priya Shet, who has been speaking to industry members, gets us a list of selectors' wish list for the finance minister. Priya, over to you. Well, the FMCG and the retail industry are hoping that the interim budget will boost overall consumption in India. Now, do remember that over the last two years, demonetization as well as the transition to GST has had a negative impact as far as spending is concerned for several pockets of the country. And therefore, the FMCG as well as the retail sector are hoping that the budget throws up some reforms that will bring about relief to the farming community at large. Now, higher rural allocation, income support schemes as well as SOPs could help 
would bring down rural distress at large and therefore the rural sector which is an important part of an FMCG company's business uh, contributing about 40% of overall sales for most FMCG companies uh, needs a more sort of allocation from the government is what several of the FMCG companies believe therefore better execution of rural schemes could also help give a boost as far as consumption is concerned. Now a long standing demand for the industry has also been to give the retail sector an industry status. This would help give it easier access to finance as well as attract more investments. Any move towards reduction of corporate tax rates will also be seen as a positive for the FMCG as well as the retail industry at large. All right, many thanks for, uh, with, uh, that, uh, for joining us with that, Priya. But with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching and have a good night.